Hello, and a very good afternoon from my hotel room here in the Romanian capital, Bucharest. Now, sadly, my time on this trip has come to an end, and it is um, time for me to return back to the UK. Um, originally, I'd planned to take the roughly two and a half hour flight from here up to London Heathrow, but then I thought, with the whole pandemic situation in the last year or so, it's been a while since I've been able to return to the UK from some far flung country by train, with the, you know, passing through several countries and whatnot thing and the border issues that have come along with the pandemic. But thankfully that is now possible and I'm going to be taking full advantage of that as I'm going to be taking the train from here in Bucharest up to London. This journey is going to span two days, travelling through several different countries on the way. We'll be going through Hungary, Austria, Germany and France on the way back to the UK. And yeah, it should be a nice trip. Hopefully there should be some nice scenery en route as well. And yeah, so I'm just going to be heading up to Bucharesti Nord and the first leg of this journey I'm going to be going to Vienna aboard a CFR sleeper. Got a solo cabin, it's about 19 hours through to Vienna. It's going to be my longest train of the year so far. Um, yeah, really looking forward to this one. I've been looking forward to this ever since I booked it. So yeah, let's get over to Bucharesti Nord and head to Vienna and on to London. Now before we head up to the station, let's just have a look at the route we'll be taking over the next couple of days. Our route will see us covering around 3,000 kilometres or 1,840 miles. First taking CFR's overnight Dacia sleeper train to Vienna, before taking a pair of German intercity express trains from there to Frankfurt and on to Karlsruhe, near the French-German border. Then it's a 320 km an hour blast on a TGV into Paris. From Paris, it's just a quick two hour hop on a Eurostar service to London. Total scheduled journey time is 46 hours and 39 minutes. Our mammoth journey starts around lunchtime at Gara Bucharesti Nord, or Bucharest North Railway Station, which is the Romanian capital's main station, with it originally opening back in 1872. While perhaps in a bit of a need of some refurbishment works, I found the station to be pretty pleasant overall, with there being plenty of shops and takeaways at your disposal. Now, being semi-open to the elements, the concourse is quite cold on this early autumnal afternoon, but there is an enclosed waiting room should you wish to sit and warm up while you wait for your train. Luggage lockers are provided should you wish to go off and explore book arrest without your bags. While it is possible, and I'd certainly recommend booking your ticket to Vienna online and in advance, no e-ticketing is offered on this route, or at least I wasn't offered it, so you have to go and pick up your ticket from the ticket office before your train departs. That said, it's a pretty quick and easy process, although I did pop down the day before, just to ensure that there wouldn't be any unnecessary hold-ups. Plenty of departure boards can be found scattered throughout the station. Now, I found these to be clear and easy to read, with information being displayed in both Romanian and English. Our train, which is CFR Kalatori's 346 Dacia service to Wien Hauptbahnhof, or Vienna Main Station, is scheduled to depart at 1400, although we don't have a platform just yet. Also, can we all just take a moment to appreciate the jingle that they play here before each announcement? Much like the departure boards, the announcements are also done in both Romanian and English. Eventually, we're told to head to platform 2 in preparation for boarding.
On the adjacent platform waits an Astra Transcarpathic service. Astra Transcarpathic are one of Romania's seemingly numerous private rail operators, who compete with the national operator CFR Calatori. Anyway, our train is eventually shunted in from the depot, around 20 minutes prior to departure. The rear three coaches will not be coming with us to Vienna, but rather will split with us along the way and head to Koslavio, a small village in the centre of Romania. Somewhat of a rarity for a Romanian train, there's a bistro car included in the consist, although this will only be available until this evening, as it also splits from the Vienna portion, so don't be expecting to have breakfast there in the morning. The Vienna portion consists of four coaches, made up of two second-class seated coaches, a couchette car and a sleeping car. We'll be travelling in the latter today and I've booked a private cabin for tonight's journey. The sleeping car we'll be travelling in is a Romanian-built Astra Arad WLAB Mi 70-31 coach. While I'm not exactly sure when they were built, they were apparently the newest type of sleeping car to operate in Romania, and they certainly look much more modern than the coach I had on the sleeper down from Cluj-Napoca a few nights ago. You'll find that video in the top right corner of the screen now. Haulage is initially provided in the form of a CFR Class 40 electric locomotive. After checking in with the friendly host, you'll be granted access to the car. And here's our home for the next 19 hours or so. Now, don't worry if you find more than one bed set up. They do this regardless of whether or not you're sharing your cabin. And we depart Bucharest, bang on time, at 2 o'clock. Scheduled journey time to Vienna will be 19 hours and 21 minutes. We're soon out of Bucharest and speeding north towards the mountains and Brasov. We eventually arrive at the foothills of the southern section of the Carpathian mountain range. There should be some rather impressive scenery in store for us over the next few hours. Eventually, one of the crew members came to ask me if I'd like to eat in the dining car, which I obviously said yes to. I say offered as the couchette and sleeping cars are locked off from the rest of the train, so they need to know when to unlock them, should you want to eat in the bistro. Now, the coach behind us is the couchette car. I'd say this is the best option if you're travelling on a budget, as... While you will be sharing with strangers, you'll at least get somewhere to put your head down for the night. A place in a 6 berth couchette will only set you back around 255 lei, which is only around a quarter of what I paid for my private cabin. More on the cost later in the video. 
Behind this are a pair of second class compartment coaches. Now, I had hoped to show you one of the compartments, but unfortunately, they were all occupied. Now, I wouldn't recommend travelling in one of these if you're on the train for much more than a few hours, as they're going to be much less comfortable and less secure than a sleeper or couchette. Then we find the bistro car. Now, I wish I could show you the menu, but unfortunately, it was just in some old tatty booklet, and it was only in Romanian, so I just had to kind of guess as to what the things were. Also note that they only accept cash, although they do accept both Romanian loo and euros. So, what was my mystery meal? Well, it turned out I'd ordered cheesy chips with salad, as well as a Budweiser beer. Total cost was six euros, which, while I was expecting it to perhaps be a little bit cheaper, is nothing compared to what you'd pay in, say, Germany, France or the UK. All meals are served with a side of stunning Carpathian views. On the way back to my cabin, I decided to head and check out the toilets. I must say, everything was surprisingly clean and, with the exception of a broken hand dryer, functioning as intended. Sleeping car passengers also have access to communal showering facilities, although you will need to bring your own towels along. Right, before I plonk myself back down, I think it's time for a room tour. The door can be double locked from the inside and you can also ask the attendant to lock it from the outside should you wish to go to the bistro. The beds on these trains are pretty wide for a sleeper train in my opinion and the mattress and bedding were of fairly good quality too, which is always good. Reading lights are provided for the lower and upper berths, as well as controls for the main lights. Each berth also has access to a plug socket, so that you can charge your Pentium laptop and Nokia brick. Now, the blind was a right pain to get down, as it would just catch on the middle berth. To get it to go down, I had to sort of half fold the berth away and then try and lower it. One nice feature of these cabins is that there's a sink tucked away in the corner. An electrical outlet for razors, a little light and a mirror are all provided here, and the sink features a mixer tap. There's a pouch and cup holder provided for each berth, and this is also where you'll find a complimentary bottle of water. A bin can be found underneath the sink. Moving further round, there's a little table with a bit of extra storage. Above this, there's a rather big mirror, as well as some coat hangers.
A ladder for accessing the upper berths can be found stored by the doors. Above the door you'll find a whole host of controls, including a thermostat which I found to be pretty effective, a call button to summon the attendant, more controls for the main lights, volume controls for the PA system and a little night light. Above this, there's a space for what should be used for storing luggage, although they were also storing extra bedding up here. And that's about it. Overall, a pretty well equipped sleeper cabin. By about 4 o'clock, we find ourselves approaching Brashov. Brashov is one of the largest cities located in the historic Transylvania region, and, featuring a rather extensive old town area, is popular with tourists. Here at Brashov Station, they have an old CFR Class 150 steam locomotive on display. I believe this particular example was built in 1941. Like the sound of ad-free early access to videos? If yes, be sure to check out our Patreon and channel members pages to get this for as little as $1 a month. All that's left for us to do after Brashov is to sit back and relax as the rolling hills of Romania glide on by. One thing I love about taking the train is that you get a whistle-stop tour of little towns and villages that there's no way the average tourist would ever see. I just think it's really cool. Eventually, the sun begins to set as we continue towards the Romanian-Hungarian border. About three hours after Brashov, we arrive at our next stop of Sigishwara, which is well known for its walled old town, which has UNESCO World Heritage status. With there now being very little to see out of the window, I decide to try and grab a few hours of sleep before we have to wake up for the border crossing. 
As Romania isn't part of the Schengen zone, my passport will need to be checked both as we leave the country and as we enter Hungary. Now, I think that the beds were maybe even a tad too comfy as I slept through my alarm and awoke to a Romanian border guard pounding on my cabin door. Stamped out of Romania, around half an hour later I was stamped into Hungary and the Schengen zone. I then next awoke at around 5am to find that we were in Budapest. Note that the train reverses direction here. Also, don't forget that we're now on Central European time, which is one hour behind Romania. We're treated to a lovely sunrise as we continue on west towards Austria and Vienna. As a result of us reversing direction in Budapest, we're now at the back of the train, giving me easy access to the best window on the train. We eventually arrive in the city of Gür, which is known for its ties to German car manufacturer Audi. After a brief stop in Hegia Shalom, we cross into Austria for our final little canter into Vienna. We eventually pull into Wien Hauptbahnhof on time at 20 past 8. <laughs> Once here in Vienna, it's possible to use my sleeper ticket or indeed the first class ticket I've got for my connecting train to Frankfurt, to access the UBB first class lounge. Much like the rest of the station, it's very modern and uplifting, with a pretty decent selection of drinks and snacks offered here. Eventually, the time comes to leave the tranquility of the lounge and head across to the platform for boarding. The service we'll be taking to Frankfurt am Main is the 1115 ICE 26 bound for Dortmund. The six hour journey through to Frankfurt will be aboard this ICE T set while capable of tilting by up to 8 degrees, it is the least E of Germany's high speed fleet, having a top speed of 230 km an hour or 143 miles an hour. First class features a rather spacious 2 plus 1 seating configuration 
as well as this rather smart and almost calming interior. Unfortunately, I'm going to be stuck in a bay of four today, as the cheapest fare that I could find was through Trainline, who don't let you pick your seat. Not great considering that I'm travelling alone on what is set to be a full train today. That said though, the bays are at least pretty spacious, and in this sort of semi-compartment style layout. You'll find a large fold-out table between the seats. There's also controls for an entertainment system, although, while I didn't have any wired headphones to test it, I highly doubt that it's still in use. Each seat also has a two-step recline system, and access to a plug socket. I also find these older first-class seats to be rather comfortable. Reading lights can be found above the seats, as can the electronic seat reservations. And lastly, there's also a window blind. And we depart Vienna on time at 11.15 for the 6 hour and 21 minute long journey to Frankfurt. After a brief stop at Vienna Meidling, it's full speed ahead through the tunnels and towards Linz and Germany. Shortly after departing Vienna, the crew came round offering coffee. Now, these aren't included in the price of your ticket, but I've always been a big fan of Deutsche Bahn's frothy cappuccinos, so I just couldn't resist having one. About an hour after departing Vienna, we stop in Austria's third largest city, Linz. A short time later, we find ourselves running alongside the River Inn as we close in on Passau. Germany is now only on the other side of the river. We eventually cross the Inn, subsequently leaving Austria and entering Germany. A few moments later, we arrive at Passau Hauptbahnhof, where we crash into, sorry, I mean couple with another unit. By mid-afternoon, we've made it as far as the city of Nuremberg, meaning we're now just a couple of hours from Frankfurt. Okay, let's go and see what else these ICET trains have to offer. These trains feature one of Deutsche Bahn's famous panoramic sections, where you can sometimes get a view out of the cab, but unfortunately, the window was set to opaque on this occasion. The front one and a half coaches of this unit are where you'll find first class. Even though today's train is very busy, I still found that there was plenty of space for storing luggage in various locations throughout each coach. The ICETs also feature a board restaurant towards the middle of the train. You'll find the full menu for this in the description below. Huh? 
Much like first class, second class is also absolutely packed. That said though, I've travelled on this route in second class before, and I still think that it's a fairly comfortable option. And I found the toilets to be all fine and, to say how busy the train was, rather clean. Around an hour out of Frankfurt, we arrive in the city of Wurzburg. A little while later, we find ourselves fast on the approach to Frankfurt main Hauptbahnhof. We soon cross the river main, taking us into central Frankfurt. We eventually pull into the rather beautiful Frankfurt main Hauptbahnhof, just a few minutes late, at 20 to 6. Now I have just under half an hour until my connecting train that will take me over to Karlsruhe where I'll then connect onto a TGV to Paris. Now for some reason it took me ages to find out which platform my train would go from which rather comedically turned out to be the very same platform that I'd arrived in on from Vienna. Our train through to Karlsruhe arrives in from Hamburg on time. The service we're taking is ICE 79, which is bound for Zurich in Switzerland. This will be operated by one of the shiny new ICE 4 sets, with this particular set being capable of 250 km an hour or 155 miles an hour. To Main Station via the ICE 4s feature Deutsche Bahn's new interiors with an updated seat and rather stylish mood lighting. Unfortunately, though, my seat, which was Coach 11, seat 94, had, shall we say, rather disappointing window alignment. Bar being a bit newer, the seats are still broadly similar to what you'd find on the older ICE trains so I won't bother boring you with another seat tour. Although, I will say that, despite what some people say, I still found these seats to be very comfy. Anyway, we've departed Frankfurt and Main on time, at just after 5 past 6, for the 1 hour and 3 minute long journey to Karlsruhe. Can I just say, I think that having the lighting as part of the luggage racks looks very smart indeed. Mein Name ist Dani Wolf, bei Farmer wird schon helfen, mein Team und ich Ihnen gerne weiter. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board the ICE to Basel, via Mannheim, Karlsruhe and Freiburg. We're soon speeding west, as the sun begins to set once more. Mm-hmm. 
Our only stop en route to Karlsruhe is in the city of Mannheim, which is of course located on the Rhine. Wir erreichen jetzt Mannheim und der Ausstieg für Sie ins Rhein. Schönen guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie bei uns hier im ICE nach Basel und wünsche eine angenehme Reise. Having now arrived in Karlsruhe on time at around 10 past 7, we now have just 20 minutes to wait until our TGV will arrive in from Stuttgart to take us through to Paris. The station here has a pretty good selection of shops and, as I hadn't really eaten a great deal since the lounge in Vienna, I took this opportunity for a quick refuelling stop before heading up to platform 6. Before long, white lights pierce through the darkness off in the distance. Our ride through to the French capital tonight will be aboard this 320 km an hour or 199 mile an hour capable TGV Euro duplex set. Once again, for the journey through to Paris Gare de l'Est, I'll be travelling in first class. We end up departing Karlsruhe a few minutes late at 25 to 8. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, willkommen in unser TGV nach Paris, Süd über Straßburg. Ich bin Damien Elliott, Ihr Zugchef. Sie Despite being a bit dated, this is still one of my favourite first class seats out there. While the legroom is okay, it's the seats themselves that I love. They're like big old armchairs and I can assure you that you're not going to be uncomfortable in one of these. Also, the seats recline is controlled electrically, which I think is rather neat. Footrests and a nice big tray table are also provided as well as one plug socket per seat. Around 40 minutes after departing Karlsruhe, we arrive in Strasbourg, our first stop in France, meaning that we've now rather impressively been in five countries in the time since the clock struck midnight. This will also be our last stop before Paris. From Strasbourg, we join the LGV Est, meaning we can run at high speed pretty much all the way to the suburbs of Paris. First class on this evening service was thankfully rather quiet. In terms of luggage storage, the overhead racks are really rather small, but there are larger ones dotted throughout the saloon and in some of the vestibules. After grabbing a quick drink from the bar, again full menu in the description below, I move to an empty bay of four and grab a bit of shut eye. Now, I think that this may have been a case of me getting a tad too comfy again, as I slept for around two hours and awoke to find that we were already well within the city of Paris and fast approaching Garde l'Est. We actually end up pulling into Gare de l'Est around 5 minutes early at 20 past 10.
Now from here, I need to make the short walk to nearby Gare du Nord to catch the Eurostar for the last bit of the trip to London. However, this doesn't depart until the morning, so I've booked a nearby hotel for the night. The cheapest hotel that I could find in close proximity to Gare de l'Est was an Ibis. It was around €96 Euros for the night, which, by Paris standards, is not too bad at all. Well, good morning, everyone. It's the last day of this journey. Um, last night, I must admit, I got in and basically just crashed out to sleep, as I did on the TGV as well. I was so exhausted that um, I just slept for most of that journey. But um, overall, a fairly pleasant journey over from Vienna. Uh, now we're going to be catching a Eurostar service through to London St Pancras. Um, thanks to the wonders of high-speed rail and the Channel Tunnel, London is only just over two hours away by train. Um, I've booked a standard ticket for this journey, standard class ticket that is, um, standard premiere is ludicrously overpriced and it's only a two hour journey, don't really need the extra space on that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to head up to Gare du Nord now, it's only a short walk here from my hotel just outside uh, Gare de l'Est and yeah, let's head to London and get this journey finished. So I hauled myself from the hotel and across to Gare du Nord, which I must say looks very picturesque with the sunrise in the backdrop to catch my last train of the trip. Despite it already being 20 to 8, the station was unusually quiet, and if you didn't know otherwise, you certainly wouldn't have thought that this was Europe's busiest railway station. And here's what will be taking us back across the English Channel this morning. It's an E320 Siemens Valaro unit. Anyway, without further ado, Let's head upstairs and clear passport control and security. Now, I've always found security to be a bit of a faff on Eurostar, and they were seemingly more concerned with checking, double checking, and then triple checking that I'd turned off my camera, as opposed to actually checking what I had in my bag. Anyway, I've now been stamped out of the Schengen zone and had my passport scanned back into the UK. If you're travelling in Standard or Standard Premier, you must pass through the ticket gates at least 45 minutes prior to departure. With all that now completed, we find ourselves in London Hall, which is the Eurostar departure lounge here in Paris. All you'll find through here though is some seating and a few overpriced shops and cafes. Boarding commences at just before 10 to 9 for an 0913 departure. As we board, here's a quick look at the Café Metropole, where you can purchase drinks and snacks. Full menu in the description below. Standard class is laid out in a 2 plus 2 configuration, with both Standard Premier and Business Premier featuring a 2 plus 1 layout. Now, this is once again set to be a very busy train, so here's a bit of a tip if you're ever travelling alone in Standard on a Eurostar service. Have a look at the seat map either the night before or the morning of your trip to see if there are any empty pair of seats, as you can change your allocated seat as many times as you like. Even on a busy service, I've rarely had anyone sitting next to me when employing this tactic. Do you know what? Legroom in standard is nowhere near as bad as I seem to remember it being, and is certainly more than adequate for a just over two hour trip. A footrest and seat back pocket are provided, as well as a large and sturdy tray table. These seats do offer a bit of recline, 
and both an EU and UK plug socket can be found per pair of seats. I find that the seats themselves are very good too, being really rather comfortable. And lastly, a window blind is also provided. We actually end up departing Paris a few minutes early for the 2 hour and 25 minute non-stop journey to London. Top speed today will be 300 kilometers an hour or 186 miles an hour. It's not long before we're out of Paris and speeding north through the morning mist towards Lille and the Channel Tunnel. Once underway, I decide to head to the cafe and grab a much needed cup of coffee and a bottle of water. For the last time in this video, it's time for a toilet tour. While the sink area was all fine, the toilet wouldn't flush, which, needless to say, wasn't great. We go speeding on through Gare de Lille Europe. As I've mentioned in the past, some Eurostar services do stop here, but I always somehow seem to end up on a non-stop service. Not long later, we find ourselves slowing as we approach the Channel Tunnel. Once in the tunnel, it'll only be about 20 minutes until we pop out the other side. We exit the channel tunnel at Folkestone and join the southeastern end of High Speed 1, which will take us through to London. Also, don't forget that the UK is one hour behind Central European time. As we go speeding on past the traffic on the adjacent M20, I think it's about time I summed up the experience. Is this the fastest, cheapest and most convenient way of travelling between Romania and the UK? Absolutely not. The British Airways flight that I'd originally booked was scheduled to take just three and a half hours from gate to gate and cost just 70 euros and I imagine you could get this even cheaper on a low cost airline such as Ryanair or Blue Air. The train, however, sure is a great adventure. It's not often you find yourself in six countries within the space of 48 hours, and not to mention that you get plenty of time to relax and unwind as the views roll on by. And there's also nothing to say that you couldn't split your journey along the way and stop off in one or more of the places that we passed through, treating it a bit like a land cruise. So, the cost. Well, I've put the cost of each leg of the trip on screen for you now, but the total cost, including the hotel in Paris, was £426, US dollars, 510 euros, or 2,518 lei. On the surface, it seems quite expensive, and that's because, well, 
It is. However, you could knock up to 75% off the Bucharest to Vienna ticket by either booking a couchette or sharing a sleeper cabin, which I would have certainly done were it not for the fact that I was filming, as well as travelling second class from Vienna to Paris, which would knock about 50% off that fare. I reckon the full trip could be easily done for under £250. For extra reference, I only booked my tickets about a month in advance. So for me at least, a journey to remember. But what did you make of the whole experience? Do let me know this and whether or not you'd consider travelling from Bucharest to London by train in the comments below. We finally pull into the majestic London St Pancras International a few minutes early at 25 to 11, giving us a total travel time from Bucharest to London of 46 hours and 35 minutes, accounting for the two hour time difference between Romania and the UK. Well, there we have it, less than 48 hours after leaving Bucharest and I am in London. Now, sure it wasn't the fastest and by no means the cheapest way of getting between the two cities. I mean, flights are like, I don't know, I've seen them going for about 30 quid on British Airways and take about two and a half hours, but it was sure of heck more of an adventure and I, <laughs> I certainly enjoyed doing it. Anyway, I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and enable notifications as I publish new trip reports every Friday. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you next Friday.